Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning Podcast for episode number 170. With John Harmon, an independent researcher who's developed a new way to define the mind and map it to the brain called MA, Memory Activation Method. This cognitive neuroscience tool enhances central nervous system medicine, natural language processing, cognitive computing, and most applied neuroscience. John's goal aligns directly with ours on the podcast to enhance humanity's understanding, appreciation, and use of the human mind and its manifestation in the brain. For those who are new here, I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator from Toronto, Canada, now in Arizona, and like many of you listening, have been fascinated with learning and understanding the science behind high-performance strategies to be used in our schools, our sports, and workplace environments. My vision for this podcast is to bring the experts to you, share their books, resources, and ideas to help you to implement their proven strategies and take the fear out of this field of educational neuroscience. My hope is that this podcast will bridge the gap between science, theory, and application. And I picked the perfect guest to do this today because he will agree with me that this topic is not easy to explain conceptually This is the reason why I record these podcasts using video, so that I can add images to explain the concepts discussed that we might at first glance think of as difficult and just dismiss them. But they're important, and I hope that we can learn these ideas together. It's been a few years that I followed John Harmon's research through LinkedIn where we connected, and I noticed that he comments and what I call pluses an idea or takes it to the next level with his understanding. I started to read his comments in my early days of learning this field because it helped me to see things through a new lens from someone more immersed in this field than me. But when learning anything new, it takes effort. And this is when you know that true learning is taking place. Whatever John would write, I would have to stop and really think about what he was saying. So here's an example. Neuroscience News posted an article recently called Single Neurons Might Behave as Networks. And someone commented on their LinkedIn post, well, why wouldn't they behave as networks? And I could agree with this train of thought as I've done a few episodes talking about brain network theory and how we now need to think of neural networks in the brain versus single parts of the brain or neurons operating individually. Someone else chimed in to give their thoughts saying, Isn't the discovery here that a single neuron can function as its own self-contained network? And John Harmon plus this comment by providing his thoughts of his takeaway of the article, where he offers the article as I read it, talks about individual neurons and their function in the context of a larger network activity. And that if a neuron doesn't function as a part of a network, then it's a noisy neuron and it doesn't contribute or is a part of any stored mental process like perception, recognition, meaning, executive control, goals, language, attention, and intention. And he guessed that 99% of neurons are part of at least one network, bringing the article into perspective for me, because with each new idea we learn, it helps us to better understand our brain and ourselves but it also opened up the door for me for more questions that I wanna get to in the interview. This is where it really helps to have experts in the field to bounce ideas off of, because we're not gonna understand everything right away. I was drawn to John's post as he helped me to understand this new area of educational neuroscience right from those beginning days when I was first learning this topic. And after years of interacting on social media, I finally asked if he would come on the podcast to share the research he's uncovered in this field. Let's meet John Harmon and learn more about how he's using this understanding of neuroscience in his consulting business as an independent researcher and to enhance humanity's understanding, appreciation, and use of the human mind and its manifestation in the brain.
Welcome, John Harmon. It's so good to meet you after following your work for so long. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Andrea. Absolutely. Now, John, before we get into your work and the questions that I have for you, I was reading your website and I thought your story is important to share because many people I've interviewed have talked about how they began in this field and then they met with some sort of controversy and then had to go back and refine their ideas. And this was certainly the case for me when I began in this field. Where did the idea to start your company, Mind Brain Insights, begin for you? And what exactly do you do over there? Okay, well, um, I've been developing my brain theory for the past 14 years. Um, the past, well, after about the seventh or eighth year, I was kind of ready to do something with it. But um, I was talking to a few um, researchers in uh, neuroscience, and uh, they weren't that interested. So I thought, well, I have to um, see if I can do something uh, commercially, because I was pretty confident that, you know, I was confident in my ideas and my model. So <clears throat> then I started exploring different commercial options, um, or, or um, actually, I should say applied neuroscience options, such as um, <clears throat> CNS medicine, and uh, CNS biomarkers and that kind of thing. Um, and then I ended up um, going into a brain computer interface and that's what I've been doing the past couple of years is studying ways to apply my uh, brain theory to um, uh, help with a uh, brain computer interface. <clears throat> so explaining what you do and actually the work you do, we've kind of discovered are two completely different things. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. It's very um, challenging for me. The easy part for me is developing the ideas, doing the research, and um, writing is easy. And um, not that I'm an expert writer, but it's the kind of thing I'm comfortable with. And so developing the ideas is the easy part for me. And the difficult part is um, now that I'm starting to try to reach out to people and explaining uh, my ideas and writing and now in the podcast, that's kind of the, like the next step for me. <clears throat> and this is exactly what I heard from my last interview with Dr. Bruce Perry. When he started, he had these ideas and his friends all thought he was crazy. And now his friends all work for him. So uh, I'm excited to learn a little bit more about what you do. And uh, so I just want to go back into how I first found you. So I, we met on LinkedIn and I call what you do when you answer somebody's question plusing an idea. So you take that person's understanding of neuroscience to a new level. So I would see your post come in um, on like a neuroscience article and then I would see you give your thoughts on it and I'd actually have to stop and really think about what you wrote because it was always something new, a new angle, a new thought, taking it beyond where I was before. And I'm not sure if I have the idea right about your core idea of your work, but I'm not afraid of being wrong. So if you could help guide me and we could learn together, do I have this right, that your core idea is that we have an active mind, so that's that we create perceptions, meanings, belief, attitude, emotions, intentions in our mind, which creates a set of memories. And we can go off on tangents with memories because each time we recall a memory, we recall it a different way. And the third part is where I think I'm off and I could use some guidance here in your direction, but this all creates a set of functional neural networks. And I imagine that all these networks are going off in our brain with different activity increasing or decreasing depending on what task we're working on. Do I have it right, your core idea? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a decent start for understanding what I'm saying. Um, I will, I'm not going to be able to fully explain it in this podcast because I'm not great at verbal explanations and because it takes actually a long time to fully explain the idea, but you know, I can give it a try. So 
you have you have your mind, which I see as basically everything that's going on inside your visual field, also outside your visual field. So you're kind of aware of what's going on behind you and what's going on, like say beyond the walls that you see, you kind of have an idea of you know empty space and maybe another building. But most of it's in your visual field. So you have the sights and the sounds going on there. And then you have what's going on inside your body and then your thoughts and, and so forth inside your head. So all, the, all that's being copied to your brain, and then the brain makes groups of those copies. So let's say you you reach for a glass of water, and then you do that 10 more times. Well, after the 10th time, your brain is starting to create a memory called reach for a glass of water. And so it's basically what general memories are, in, in my mind, is they're groups of experience, that a, a similar experience. So reach for a glass of water. And as it turns out, I worked with this concept for a couple of years. And what I found was that most of the mind um, is, is actually, um, you know, from a, from a mechanical point of view, most of the mind is, is general memory, um, which isn't to say that people's minds are all, all mechanical. I don't believe that. But um, when you have a mechanistic view of the mind, you can break it down into general memories. And then, and then the functional network part comes in where if you have a general memory, like let's say reach for a glass of water, let's say you've done that 10,000 times in your life. Well, you have a pretty developed general memory of reach for a glass of water. So the next time you reach for a glass of water, when you think I'm about to reach for a glass of water, that activates the general memory reach for a glass of water. So it kind of activates it in total. So you kind of have a prediction of drinking the water and quenching your thirst and so forth. <clears throat> So that's the general memory that gets activated as you have the intention. And then when you go to do it, it activates the, the parts of that general memory. So reach your hand, arm forward, grasp, lift, you know, lift to your mouth, sip. And um, so the general memory is being uh, kind of played through as you're, as you're acting. So that's kind of what I'm saying about general memory is that it, um, actually it comprises, if you, if you look at it closely, if you look at the mind closely and study it um, kind of along the same lines that I did over the years, I came to the conclusion that most of the mind and pretty much all of the me meaning of the mind is comprised of, of a general memory. Um, and, and then <clears throat> to add into the functional network part, if you, have, if you have general memories that are active in your mind as you're throughout the day, you also have a set of functional neural network ranges that are active. So what I mean by ranges is if you have a general memory of reaching for uh, taking a sip of water, you wouldn't just have one memory of taking one sip of water. It's actually a, a group or a range of taking a sip of water memories, right? So it's not a single instance where the cup is slightly to your right and the water's got some ice in it and the cup's a certain shape and so forth. It's, it's all, all the different possibilities that go into taking a sip of water. So that's, it's a, it's a group. It's not like a single memory. So that's what, so basically, and then the same thing with a functional network, when you, when you reach, when you activate that memory in a single instance, it's, it's a functional neural network, but the memory it, as a whole is a group. So that's, that's where you have a functional neural network group or, or a range of functional neural networks. So that's what the memory taking a sip of water is. It's, it's a general memory and it's also equal to a, uh, a range of functional neural networks. So this uh, is important for learning a new skill, learning a subject, because we've got to practice that skill. They talk about spaced repetition being important. So now I'm kind of looking at spaced repetition in a new way. It's like a group of every time you practice a skill, let's say every time you do a math problem, it's like overlapping a memory of when you did it the past time and you have to keep practicing until it's automatic. Is that how it's working? Uh, sure. Yeah. That's basically how, how it works. I mean, um, you know, it depends on the, the math. it depends on the kind of math problem, I guess, but in general, yes, if you're doing a specific 
type of math problem, then you're forming a general memory of that, of you doing that math problem. So it's not just the math problem that's a general memory for you. It's also all the things that you, that are in your mind besides the cognitive aspect. So the emotional part, let's say you're not super confident at math and you might have some negative emotions as you're doing the math problem. And then you have, you know, intentions on doing well, which would kind of be carried in, in each, each time you're doing the math problem, you'd have those intentions, those emotions and so forth. But um, as far as the cognitive part, yeah, you'd have a, you'd have a uh, memory of a general memory of the math problem. And every time you learn something new about the problem, you'd be adding to that general memory to, um, I guess, make it, make it more of a memory that was more effective for you to solve that kind of problem. Got it. So I think I've, I've got your core idea. And so now we want to take your core idea and think about how it relates to learning in relation to the mind. So how could we as educators or someone learning a sport or someone learning a new skill, think about your core idea with regards to learning? What, what should we know? Okay, well, <clears throat> let's see, as far as learning, again, I, again, my work is more along the a mechanistic kind of um, viewpoint. And the first thing I would say is that um, if you're trying to learn anything about the mind, that you really should look to the mind first and the people who are experts in say learning. So um, I, can't, I, I can't really add anything to the subject of learning that probably hasn't already been discussed in the literature and, and experts in learning would know more about the subject than me. But I can, I can go somewhat into the, the mechanism of learning it's neurally. Yeah. So um, as far as the mechanism of learning, so you have, let's say you have two memories that are active simultaneously. You have a memory, um, one memory, um, let's go back to the math problem, I guess. So you have a memory of the math problem, and then you have a memory of um, your attitudes toward math. And let's say that you want to change your attitudes toward math. So when you're doing a math problem, you can concentrate better and not feel so, um, you know, not, you, you seem to feel more confident and more focused. So in that case, you take, you activate your, your math problem memory. You might activate your general math memory as well. You're you doing a math problem memory and uh, you'd activate all the memories that were involved in becoming more um, sort of at ease and focused while doing a math problem. And you activate those simultaneously with doing the math problem. And so you have two different groups of, well, you have, you have it, uh, two different neural networks activated at the same time. So you have two different memories activated at the same time. One would be the math, math and the math problem. The other would be your attitude toward it. So if you, if you change that, that second, if, if you change, if you change your attitude, then you're, you're changing that, um, that second memory so that it's a different kind of attitude. And what that's doing is that's simultaneously activating those two memories so they start to form that connection. So you have two functional neural networks that start to form a connection functionally. And then the more they're activated simultaneously, they, they also start to um, form con a connection with the neural circuits involved in those two neural networks. But again, it's not, it's not a single functional neural, it's not two functional neural networks. Well, I should say it is and it isn't. Like if you have, if you have one instance where you're doing that, then you have two functional neural networks that are becoming connected. And then you also have two general memories and functional neural network ranges that are also becoming more connected. Now, if you keep doing that and you, and you keep doing the math problem and attitude um, pairing over different circumstances and over different time, then you start to form a connection between the function, between the general memory, those two general memories and the two functional network ranges. And that's where you get the, uh, the real more of a cementing in of the um, connection between the, 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 the circuits, you know, because obviously you, you, want, you want to be able to pair those two in all circumstances, not just when you're doing homework at home, but also at school and when you're taking a test and so forth. So that's kind of the, um, maybe more of a, a mechanistic view of um, learning is, is you're, you're taking two networks 
at least two. I mean, it could, could be two dozen, but two networks and you're activating them simultaneously. And those are, fun, those are, those are functional neural network ranges in the brain, which are activated simultaneously. And those, those are what um, cause the connection first functionally through time and then structurally, you know, over time. So that's kind of the basic, um, yeah, that's kind of the basic idea. So um, what, what I got from that that's pretty profound is that we've all known the importance of attitude and social emotional learning, growth mindset, how we feel about doing our math. So you're saying that that can be measured at the brain level. You can see a student coming in maybe with fear during a math test in the brain. Yes, definitely. Of course. I mean, I think any neuro, any neuroimaging person or neuroscientist would probably agree with that. Um, it's interesting because um, you have you have the memory of fear that's activated. I mean, I, I look at fear as a memory, basically. Mm -hmm. And then you have the math memory, but you you could just have um, like a certain type of fear regarding math. So then you have like a math fear, and that that's actually like a subset of fear, right? So that's right. like a subset of the neural network. Sorry, the the functional neural network range fear, which is a huge memory. And then you have like all these subsets of fear, like fear of math, fear of this, fear of that. And um, so in that case, it would, it would activate both the fear memory in general, and then more specifically, the fear of math memory. And it would activate some other fear-based memories too, like maybe fear of academic failure or, um, you know, things like that. So um, how we feel during our academics is extremely important. We, we know this, but you can see it. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, for sure. I mean, I, I, I wasn't somebody that was afraid of tests or things. I'm more afraid of social, <laughs> social kinds of situations than I am academic things. But yeah, I think for a lot of people, I've heard that taking tests can be quite uh, fear-inducing. But I can kind of give some of the mechan. I mean, I've been working more on the mechanics side of learning, so. That's been my focus. But. So, so I think about all the things that I've been afraid of. Definitely math was one of them. And then there's another one that that it's like a fear that just never goes away. I can still remember standing at the starting line in a cross country running race and everyone's all there and you don't know if you're going to fall and the person's getting ready to shoot the gun and you've got the race ahead of you. That fear of like, am I going to trip? Am I going to like make the race? So if I was starting off that way with that fear in my mind, do you think that I probably would have had like a, a crappy race considered if I was sitting there with a better attitude before I ran? <laughs> uh, possibly. <laughs> I, I can't say for sure. Um, it's possible that the fear also activated, um, you know, the adrenaline, mm -hmm. which is so it made me run running. Faster. Sure. But it, I think ideally you'd want to have the adrenaline without the fear, you know, maybe that would be the ideal, the exactly. ideal uh, way to um, activate your neural networks. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of all the times that, that fear comes in, it comes in with sports, it comes into, like you said, social situations for some people. And we all know how important these social and emotional skills are. I never really thought about them in, in, at the brain level, how much that they would impair um, the the results of somebody like we we know it, but I I never thought of what it looks like. Right. Yeah, it's interesting to look at it from a you know a brain point of view as well. I will make a general point um, about that, which is um, I I think that in my opinion, I think any kind of um, Thing that you find out about your mind or, or think that, that you think works or doesn't work. I think it's interesting and it can be really useful to know the brain mechanics, but I also don't think that you need to know the brain mechanics in order to make it work. So um, I think if, you know, that that's just kind of a general view I have is um, I'm, I'm that that's how I came up with my brain theory is I started with the mind and I just kept the mind at the forefront the whole time. And, um, 
that was one of the things that uh, kind of like a mind first approach to understanding the brain. So um, but I kind of have that, you know, I had just kind of have that view that um, you don't need to understand the brain mechanics or look into the brain to understand what the mind's doing, that you can understand the mind independent of the brain. <clears throat> what about your thoughts, belief states, emotions being manifested physically in the brain? Is, is, do I have that right? That you can actually see your emotions in the brain? How does that show up? Um, sure. I mean, it's like any, any, um, anything that goes on in the mind. I think, re I don't think any researchers have, have identified anything in the mind that is, doesn't also show up in the brain. And uh, it, of course, it's a very counterintuitive idea to think of your feelings being a brain, a uh, brain pattern, like a, a functional neural network, or um, your, you know, a feeling of pain. How is that a, how is that a signal in the brain? It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. But then the, uh, the whole ish, the whole topic of co human consciousness is very counterintuitive, and it's, it's kind of a strange topic to uh to ponder and you know people have written lots of books about it and how strange it can be to think about so you were talking about pain being in the brain and so so let's like do, do you know anything about let's just say someone's got like neck pain like i've always had neck pain and i went to a hypnotherapist and they taught me this strategy to get rid of the neck pain. And I'm telling you, it works. Like you, you say this thing over and over again, or imagine like a, an ice pack on the back of my neck or something like that. And it really does get the pain from, from high to like really low. Is that my mind impacting the brain or how does that work? Do you know anything about that? Yeah. Um, well, I can, I can definitely speak to the placebo effect in pain because I've done some research on that. Um, so the placebo effect is basically a belief state. It's a belief that you're going to get better, or whatever better means to you. And in the case of pain, it would basically mean that your pain is going to be reduced or eliminated. So you have this belief. Let's say you take a couple of aspirin or something even stronger, a stronger pain medication. And then you believe that your pain's going to go away. And what research has shown is that a good chunk of the pain actually going away is, is not due to the medication. It's due to your belief in it. Hmm. And so um, what I would say to that is I'd say that a belief is a, is a functional neural network in the brain that's activated. So when you activate a belief, you're activating that functional neural network. And you're also activating a, a whole bunch of associated memories like for example, um, doctor healing, um, expertise, you know, doctors have expertise. They know the right kinds of medications to prescribe. You have a network of, well, I've taken this medication before and it's made my pain less. So you have that memory and you have all these memories that, um, are activated and, and those in turn are, are connected functionally to, the more the really critical memories, which are your pain. So let's say you have uh, shoulder pain. You take some aspirin. You have a memory of your shoulder pain, and that memory is activated when you take the the medicine. And it will. And what you're saying to yourself is, I I'm going to take this medicine. It's going to reduce my shoulder pain. Shoulder pain being a memory, but it's a functional neural network in your brain. So you're what you're doing is you're connecting all these memories to the crucial memory of my shoulder pain and what that in effect does is it is it uh either dampens and degrades or well, it either dampens the shoulder pain signal and and it also works to compete against the signal so that you're feeling other things besides shoulder pain like for example um this is kind of um not proven but i i believe it like a state of of lack of any 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 somatic sensation, that could be a memory or a, a, a memory of pleasure or a memory of heat or cold. So anyway, <clears throat> that's that's the basic idea behind 
the, the, the mechanism behind the placebo effect that I see is that you have a memory of shoulder pain and then you have all these memories that connect to it and they work to um, influence that signal in the brain. So you have a whole bunch of neural networks that end up um, competing against and, and reducing that um, shoulder pain signal. Um, so as far now what was, so and then you have, Based on my belief that hypnotherapy worked, that's like if, if I didn't believe it, so then I wouldn't have been able to reduce the pain. Is it the belief in the hypnotherapy or? Yeah, that's all. You, that's all you would. That's all you would need, I guess, would be a belief that the hypnotherapy is going to work and that your pain, which is a memory, is going to be reduced. And so, if you have um, those memories um, activated simultaneously that would connect to the pain memory. Wow. So that's, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty, I don't know cool. if I explained that. Well, no, I, I think, I, I think I've got it. So if you believe that anything's going to work, it's, it's going to help. But like for me taking an aspirin, I don't believe it because I know the aspirin is going to do something to my stomach lining. So I'm like, Oh, I don't want to take aspirin. I'll, I'd rather go for the alternative in my head. So you, you know what I mean? So probably aspirin is not going to be the best solution for me because I don't believe in it. I think it's going to do more harm. Is, is, that, <laughs> is that a good, a good way to think about it? Even if it's, there's something that goes into my receptors and that that's in the aspirin that's going to get rid of the pain. I just think it's going to mess up other things. <laughs> yeah. If you believe that it will, that it probably has a better chance of messing things up. Wow. That, that's my opinion, but wow. Um, wow. so yeah, the power of belief it's uh, what that's what I'm saying is that the power of belief is um, it's a physical uh, you know, it's a physical force inside your brain in, in the form of, uh, functional neural networks, or, you know, we could also say coordinated neural activity that, um, you know, you have different regions of the brain and if they, f if they fire in synchrony and they, they influence one another, then they're working in coordination. Um, so that that's basically what a functional neural network is. And, um, certainly belief. Yeah. To me, belief is, um, you know, it's one of the it's a powerful one when it comes to healing. Um, there's also a thing called a nocebo effect, which instead of instead of your beliefs and your your mind making your symptoms better, they they can make them worse if you believe they're gonna that what's going on is gonna make it worse. So that's that's also something that um, is you know well established in the literature is something that has a real effect. So this makes like company mission statements, you know, when you walk into a company and they have a mission statement, everybody believes in the mission statement and the, the company at a brain level is, is on track, would you say, or a school with a mission statement? Like, you know, we believe that we're gonna instill these characteristics in our students. What, what do you think about that? Instilling belief in companies in our schools? Um. I think it's great if people are interested and on board with it. And uh, I think it can have a, have an effect. It all depends of course, on a lot of things, but um, I definitely believe in the power of the mind and um, uh, the power to sort of change your mind as well. I think, um, you know, it's something I've been kind of working on my whole life in one way or another, but um, it's something that, um, at least in theory, it's something that people really have a um, lot of a lot of say over. Um, I'm not somebody who's like more of a brain. I've already said this, but I'm I'm not a brain first guy. I don't believe that like the brain is um, in control of you or in control of your life. I think that your mind is expressed inside your brain. That's my my view, my personal view of it. So you have your mind, and your you have your you have choice, you have some, you know, fair amount of control over your mind. It might not be total control, but it, you know, cause it all depends on the person too, but um, you have your mind, you have some free will choice. Um, these are things that you have, especially if you believe in them, <laughs> then you have them. And uh, the brain isn't, isn't uh, there are patterns in the brain that can definitely um, become patterns in the mind or that can, that can, make it so it's harder to change the patterns in your mind, but um, 
it's not like the your brain is in charge. When you wake up in the morning, your brain kind of tells you what to do throughout the day. I don't. I think it's uh, quite the quite the opposite. Um, so. So what what is that that's in charge of us? Um, if if it's not our brain, is the mind our captain and of our, our of our path or our higher self? Who's in charge of us as we wake up in the morning? Uh, that's a great question. That's <laughs> people have written lots and lots of books about um, the nature of the self um, from all, all kinds of different angles, from psychology. There's lots and lots of uh, books written on the spiritual side of, of things, religious side of it, things. Um, there's lots of different uh, types of psychology that have a say in what the mind is and how it develops, you know, evolutionary psychology and interpersonal psychology. And <clears throat> so it's a very complicated topic. Um, and uh, as far as who's in charge, it's interesting because there has been uh, the neuroscience on free will it basically shows that um, a, lo a lot of people call into question whether there is free will because what they see is they see the neurons in the brain start to fire off before a decision is made. So a person goes to presumably exercise their free will to do something, but just before they report having a, a sensation that they've exercised their free will, the neurons involved in that choice start firing off. So that would indicate that maybe they're not as in control as they think they are. And then of course you have things like the unconscious. So maybe uh, in a lot of cases, the unconscious would kind of say, you should better do this now. And then your conscious mind goes, I'm gonna do this. And you think you're making a choice, but maybe it's your unconscious. So um, it's an interesting topic. It's not something I really central to my work or anything, but um, well, it is in, in the sense that I, um, I, I have a mechanistic point of view on the brain. So about 80, 90% or so of the brain I see, uh, and, and in routine tasks, it's higher than that, I see as being memory. So if you have reach for a cup of coffee and you take a sip and do that successfully, that's, that's like 95% memory. But there is that five, there isn't the 5% or 10% or whatever, uh, especially if you're doing things that aren't so routine if you're doing a spiritual practice or meditation. And in that case, you have uh, the mind. Well, what I guess I think of is like the higher mind or the higher self that can get involved. And that, that happens when you're doing, um, maybe when you're doing meditation or spiritual practice or a contemplation of some spiritual uh, type or, or prayer um, or something like creativity. Um, you know, you're, um, that those kinds of things where you're, where you're using, um, where you're not being so routine in how you're thinking and feeling and so forth. And you're, you're connect, you feel like you're connecting to like a higher um, force that's, at, that's outside of yourself. And uh, so that, in that case, it wouldn't be a memory. I, I still think there's a memory component to it because even those, if you, if they happen in, enough and are similar enough, will form general memories. But I also think that there, I definitely open the possibility that your, that your brain and your mind can connect to larger forces that are basically outside of yourself and that you could call um, like a higher, higher self or a higher mind. Um, but of course, I'm not alone in thinking that there's lots of people that are, have a lot, know a lot more about, you know, the higher self than I do. But um, I just want to make that point that it's, I have a very mechanistic view of the mind and the brain, but it doesn't cover um, it doesn't cover the like the higher self and the higher mind, which I which I um, you know is, isn't quite as isn't quite so as mechanistic. Well, it's you're giving me lots to think about here, and one thing that came to mind um, because we just did an interview with. Um, Chris Gargano, who works with the New York Jets, and I'm always trying to make connections between episodes. And so when we're thinking about how the brain works with learning, we've talked about how belief is important. What about, let's say, when you're under pressure, like these teams that are under pressure to perform, what happens to the brain, let's just say, while throwing a football? while under pressure to score a touchdown, and I'm not a football um, expert here, but 
what what happens to the brain when you're under pressure uh okay so um my view and again it's mechanistic and it, it's not <laughs> i'm not a football coach so i'm not going to give any advice on how to uh how to throw a football under pressure but um <clears throat> what, you, what you have is you have two sets of memories you have one set of memories which is the memories involved in throwing a football successfully and um you know, the, these are formed under uh, lots and lots of repetition during practice. And so, and that involves a whole bunch of things. It involves, um, it, it, you know, it's not just throwing. You're also seeing who you're throwing to. Is the receiver open? Is he covered? What are the linemen doing? You know, is, is there pressure? Where's the pressure coming from? Do I need to move before I throw? You know, how, how, how many, how many, milli, you know, how many uh, moments do I have before I get hit, before I can, get the pass off and there's lots of things, but um, you learn all that in practice. So that's, that's the memory of making a successful throw in practice. So that would be a general memory. And that whole memory, it's actually a set of memories is uh, kind of uh, honed during practice. And then the idea is when you're in that pressure situation, if you can activate that memory, that same memory um, under those similar circumstances, of the game, which is similar to uh, practice. And um, if you can activate that memory, then you, you know, of course you have a, a much better chance of making that throw successfully, but you have a, a second set of memories, which is a competing set of memories. So things like um, fear, like let's say you feel like the lineman is coming, uh, pass rushing you and he's gonna hit you 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 might have a, a fear reaction. So that would be a memory of getting hit in the past and what that felt like. And the, or it could be like a fear of failure. You missed the throw and how bad you felt about that, how you let your teammates down. So all these are sort of competing memories that compete and again, work to um, dampen or uh, degrade the memory set that you wanna keep active, which is the memory set that you've learned when you make a successful throw. So that, that's one way, well, that's the way I, I, I see it in a mechanistic way is that if you're, if you're trying to make a successful throw, you, it, it's basically a competition between two sets of memories. One set is the memories that will enable you to make a successful throw. And then the other is the set of memories that interfere with activating those memories. So. Um, Got it. And how do you focus on choosing the successful pass and, and let the other one, can that other memory um, fade away, be smaller so that you choose the right neural pathway to have a successful pass? Yeah, uh, I think it's complicated. It's something, again, that a uh, professional football player would be able to explain or a coach I would probably be even better because they've thought about it more cognitively, but um, it takes practice and it's very complicated because you don't want to have, you want to, you want to, um, with, with the second memory set, with the memory that's com set that's competing against your good throw memories, you want to activate that enough so that you have practice with uh basically ignoring it so that's why in practice you know it's good to do some uh things where the pass rush is really coming at you so that you can practice overcoming your fear staying calm moving your feet and so forth so that you're confronted with those competing memories and that and that you can then know how to um kind of manage manage your emotions or manage your thoughts so that you can kind of adjust to those memories. So that's that's part that's part of the um, that's part of the memory set that would be successful. Would be the memories that cause you to um, uh, to deal with those competing memories successfully. Well, this is very helpful. So if I go back to my very first question for what your core idea is, can I try it again and see if after we've had this discussion, if I improved at all? and learned from from this session can i try it again and yeah. and see if did i get it better than the first time that's the goal 
Yes. Yeah, sh- yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So this is like high, high stressful. I'm trying to choose like <laughs> not the fear part. So um, your core idea is that we have an active mind where we have perceptions, meaning, beliefs, attitudes, emotions, intentions, which create a set of memories. Now we can have competing memories. So with practice, we have memories of doing a math problem correctly, memories of throwing a football correctly, but we also have competing ones where we have memories of uh, doing a math problem with fear or you know, throwing a football and someone like plows you over. And so we want to, in our practice time, practice without the fear, practice uh, a space repetition of practice the way that we want to perform on a math test or in a game or even in a work environment. Um, Practice our sales call or whatever, closing the sale. I'm just trying to take this to all sectors. Did I get that part right? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with most of that. The, the only thing I disagreed with is, is when you said at first, you said that uh, the mind activates a set of memories. And what I would say, what, what I would say is that <clears throat> sensation and perception activate a set of memories. So let's say you look at an object and then you say, I've seen that before. And then you say, oh yeah, that's my favorite coffee cup. And then you say, yeah, there's coffee in it and so on and so forth. So the sensation and the perception of that object, the, the shape and the color and so forth, activates a set of memories. That's true. But what I would say is the mind is mostly memory and from a mechanistic point of view. Um, again, except for the higher mind and the higher self, which is kind of a different category. But uh, the rest I, I basically agree with. Um, and um, I think if it's helpful for people to understand the mechanism behind uh, memory and and the mechanism behind learning. And then uh, I think that's great. And, um, you know, so that's something, of course, I'm very interested in it. Um, Not just from us, not so much from a self help point of view. For me, it's more of um, the other aspects of applied neuroscience, like uh, brain computer interface, where, where it's really important to understand the mechanism of uh, the, the brain signal. And um, so you have you have your state of mind and then you have, uh, let's say you have an intention to reach your arm forward and then you have the, uh, the brain signal which corresponds to your intention. And it, the thing is your brain signal also corresponds to your entire state of mind. So it's not just the intention. So anyway, that's the kind of thing that is interesting to me right now is taking the mechanism of the mind and the brain and applying it to different aspects of applied neuroscience, such as brain computer interface. I think it all depends on the person if someone's interested in learning more. And I do think with the placebo effect, what's interesting about that is that um, I think you can actually enhance your placebo effect if you do know more about, if you do understand the placebo effect more, I think you could actually enhance it. Because what you're doing is you're you're getting becoming more knowledgeable about the memory set that's activated in conjunction with, with your belief with your beliefs, and so if you understand that memory set better, you know what you're activating, and you know how how it's connected to um, the symptoms that you're having. Then I I think that it, it's just kind of a theory of mine, but I do think that there's potential there as far as um, if you believe something, knowing what you believe and having a clear understanding of it and how and even how it how it's uh, manifest in the brain can help with um, with the placebo effect um, as far as making it more effective. So that anyway, it, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm interested in. <laughs> so did we cover everything if we if you think about everything that we've talked about your core idea, you think I've kind of got it? Except, uh, you know, you just added a little yeah. bit of refinement. Is, and then we take this to the classroom. It's important how we believe with everything that we're doing, that, we're, that we have a growth mindset behind our math, that, 
you know, if we're in a corporate space that we're on track with the mission or if we're on a sports team that we believe the same thing that everyone else believes that we're on track with our goals. Is, is there something that I've missed or is that have I got the core idea of everything? I would basically agree with what you're saying. Um, it all depends on the person and the situation as well. Um, so everyone's different. And, um, but I think that definitely beliefs and all the other things that you mentioned are states of mind that um, are things that also are also um, active in the brain as well. So, so John, I want to thank you so much for your time to speak with me today on this topic that is not the easiest to explain, but I think you did a great job at helping me to understand better how the mind and the brain maps to learning and belief and our perceptions and our memories. Uh, for people who want to learn more about your work, I've put a link to your website. Is it neuralnetworkbiomarkers.com? Is that the best place or is there another place? Yes, that's the URL, I think it's called. Um, but it's all, you could also Google Mind Brain Insights. Got it. So for anyone who wants to learn more about your work, they can go to your website, they can find you on LinkedIn, they can see how you plus articles on neuroscience. I, I did a backstory where I explain how I found you and how you've taken my level of understanding of neuroscience to a new level. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it.